Young Gal. <laughs> This is certainly an OTF event. I never realized there were so many people in Nova Scotia. <laughs> I'm very grateful for all of you to have been turned up. And um, maybe I should... Um, anybody have a bottle of water somewhere? I just use it as a prop. <laughs> no water? Any, anything. Okay, yeah. Okay. I start. You can come back now. I start by quoting. I was at a conference in England and then there was this uh, architectural critic, Ken Warpole. And he he stood there with a with an object like this, and then he said, I feel sorry for you architects. Because your mean of communication is a still photo and the three two-dimensional drawing. And by this way of communication, you all the time focus on the form. But my friends, this is not architecture. This is sculpture. Architecture is not about form only. It's about life and form. And only if the life and form has a good interaction, is this good architecture. So he felt sorry for us architects, and I think he has reasons to do that, because we have been very much, and still are, very much focused on the form, but good architecture is the interaction. It's a good, lucky, wonderful interaction of life. It's been my privilege to lie on my knees for 50 years and taking care Take looking closer on this because studying form is quite easy, but studying life is quite complicated. And that's one of the reasons why everybody has been studying form very intensively, and so few have studied life and the interaction between form and life. This is complicated to study. There is a famous quote by the mayor of Bogota. Enrique Peñalosa, he was mayor from 1998 to 2000, but he's mayor again now. And he said, it's, it's very interesting to notice that we know so much about good habitat for urban, for, no, for mountain gorillas and for Siberian tigers and about the love life of the whales, but we lo know so little about good urban habitat for Homo sapiens. That's a challenge. Okay, I will speak about livable cities for the 21st century and I will try to relate it a bit to Halifax and I'll end up um, doing something I shouldn't do, talking about Halifax. Um, <laughs> this tells it all. My point is that for the 21st century we have we are focusing increasingly on, on livable cities, on something about quality of life rather than quantity. And a, a very good way to address this would be to have a people-oriented city planning as a general strategy. And that, that, that was for Halifax, actually, that last sentence. Um, I will, being being in my age and having been around for all these uh, years, I have the privilege to, to be able to maybe see some of the various phases we've been through. Um, much of my life has been to, to, this, to, to consider what happened in the second part of the 20th century. And certainly we had in that period two major problems for architecture and for planning. And there were some major paradigms which controlled everything we were, forced, uh, we were asked to do. One was the modernism. 
And I take the 1960 as a starting point here because that was the time when modernism really took off. It was hanging around as, a, as, a, as an ism, as an ideology for quite a while. And good old Corbusier was the one who said that cities are bad. What is good is vertical freestanding building. He called this the vertical um, garden city because everybody could see some grass from up there. Later on, they could only see the parking lot, but that's another story. And it was really a very, very strong um, ideology. They said, now we have modern times. Everything is new. Everything is modern. We have new city planning, new site planning. We have a new architecture. We have a new, we have a new man. Man is a modern man. Everything for the old man we have to throw out because now it's modern times and we had to do everything different. And they were very, uh, just to show uh, how consistent uh, Corbusier was in his thoughts, this is his plan for improving Paris from the, from around nine, from the late 20s uh, the idea was to take down everything in Paris and build 24 high-rise where all the Parisians could sit and consider what, a, what lucky they were to be in Paris. Um, but this was new and it was new man. 19, around the time, all this was hanging around as an ideolo ideology, but around 1960, the cities really started to expand. It was 20. 15 years after the Second World War and the economy was coming along and people were moving to the, to the cities and all the cities had to expand. Many cities had to be rebuilt and then they had to build really big units to overcome the great interest in living in cities. So instead of doing, as the old days, one house by one house by one house, expanding the city along the streets and squares of, of the old cities. The, the new city planners doing all this new stuff, they literally took off in aeroplanes and they flew over and started to, to do all this, uh, or moving the objects around until they looked nice from the aeroplane. The um, site planners were also given big task of finding out these big units and they were hanging around in helicopters and finally adjusting these wonderful new things based on buildings, freestanding buildings with leftover space between them. What did not happen in this period was that nobody realized that in this process from doing the old cities to doing the single buildings with grass between and leftover space, nobody was at all taking care of where the people were to move around. Um, one would say that the landscape architects would be looking after this, but looking closer to what the landscape architects have been doing, they were also down on their knees doing all kinds of other things than looking after the people. They look better after the people than the architects and the planners, but not good enough. So we have endless um, communities which came to look like this because nobody was asked to look after people and nobody thought it was a problem. The modernists, they really thought that if they had ventilation and, and water in the flats and roof over the head, every, every problem of society would have been solved. I call this way of building the Brasilia syndrome. Brasilia was the capital of Brazil. It was a big competition, 1955, won by Da Costa, and Brasilia is fantastic. You fly over it, and there it is. It's an eagle. It looks fantastic from the air. The head of the eagle is the parliament. And if you come down in helicopter and closer to the buildings, uh, of Niemeyer, you can see his wonderful, um, his wonderful composition of ministers lying along this grand mall and the parliament in the distance. Fantastic, wonderful. 
Unfortunately, uh, if you go down at eye level, Brasilia is shit. <laughs> nobody, nobody really in that kind of, of, of paradigm thought about the Brazilians. They thought about what it looked from the air and what it looked from the helicopter, and nobody thought that they wouldn't have enough money to give all the Brazilians a helicopter each so they can enjoy <laughs> their city. So they have and still have to trample along endless paths which goes from almost nowhere to nowhere and the enormous grass lawns which are crisscrossed by shortcuts. So everything is fine in Brasilia on, on, except where the people are to be. I have been very critical to the modernist as a as a ideology for architecture and planning in relation to how they treat the people and the life and the interaction. They didn't know a thing about that. And then I have concluded here that if at any time in history a bunch of professional planners were given money to go and reduce life in public spaces, it could never have been done more efficiently than did the modernists. They were really good. Think of sitting there on this bench with your, with your girlfriend and talking about the future, wonderful <laughs> future you have and, and what, 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 life in, what kind of life there was in front of you, whatever. They were very efficient. The other big things that happened around this time was a car invasion. And again, it started slowly, but it became really a, a, a tsunami around 1960 where the cars really came flooding in. And we started, all of us, to think that the biggest problem in city planning was to get room for more cars and have capacity for more cars, more parking, whatever. And it started slowly. This is from the turn of the previous century, from one of the three squares in Copenhagen, where you can see people walking. The city belonged to the people. They walk leisurely. There's a single car there somewhere, and there's a few horses, whatever. But this was. But then the car came here. They're arriving in a Danish city. And at once, the people started to be chased out of the public spaces. And phase three is here, where the car is the king of the whole city. This is a pedestrian crossing. What happened in this process was that all the cities in the world, they at once started to develop transportation departments, which looked after everything about tra transport and parking. And typically for all these very, very efficient and, and very good professionals were, that they had perfect statistics concerning everything with car and transportation. Every year they counted all the cars going that way and all the cars going that way. And all the time they were able to come up to the mayor and say, look at the figures, mayor. We need four more lanes here, two more streets there and whatever. Everything was done very carefully to make the cars happy. In all these 50 years, there were no city anywhere who had a department for pedestrians and public life. And there were no city anywhere who had any inkling about how the people used the city or had documentation systematically about how people used the city. So in this situation, when the mayor had to make his decisions, there were these guys with all the figures and 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 and, and forecasts and whatever, and the other guy said, we have to be good to people, and then he made an extra lane. As, because we know now that um, what you know about, you plan about, and you care about. And so making investigations about life is really a very important thing, to make sure that the life in the city is treated just as carefully or more carefully than the happiness of the motor car, whatever. Now, by the way, we have many cities who have such departments, but we had to learn it the hard way. Uh, 
um, what was known about quality for people by 1960? The answer is that virtually nothing was known because all the knowledge we had was thrown out by the modernists. They say everything about old cities we can't use no more. All the experiences from many generations of city building and all the, the traditions, whatever, everything was discarded. Now we have the new man and we have this new philosophy of how we shall build cities. Go and do that. Then came from New York the first strong voice against this. It was Jane Jacobs sitting in Greenwich Village. She was an architectural journalist and she was fighting very much against Robert Moses, the transport engineer from New York. He had this vision of modernizing, improving, making New York a fantastic place by cutting three major freeways across Manhattan and taking down the old redundant stuff and building some nice high-rise so you can enjoy New York better. Unfortunately, his, high, his, his vision for the freeway, and we have a close-up here, the Manhattan, the Lower Manhattan Expressway, the Lomax, that implied taking down Greenwich Village, which was for, for everybody to see completely redundant and very old and could go, and so could Little Italy and and uh, Tribeca and quite a few of the nice areas in this area, they had to go. So we could have the Lomax and all these nice pine rides. Unfortunately, Jane Jacob lived in Greenwich Village and she, <laughs> she uh, was in the head of a big organization of people of inhabitants who protested wildly. They were really protesting wildly and spent quite a few periods in jail because they interrupted the public uh, peace by their yelling and their doings. But they actually won this fight against Robert Moses. The Lomax was never built. And she wrote this book about her experiences. And what does she say in the book? She say that if you make the cities following the ideas of the modernists and the motorists, the great cities will become dead cities. She also said, for God's sake, look out of the window to the streets in front of you and see that the streets are the, are the basic element in the city and the streets are what should be made livable and friendly. And she said, watch what's going on in the sidewalk, watch what's the, the importance of the corner store, how the kids uh, lo roam around and the old people, whatever, watch and take the departure point in the people in the city instead of all these uh, philosophical ideas of making freeways and to m make life much better. My own life, short story. Um, I graduated exactly in 1960 and I was trained in the 50s and we were trained as good modernists. Most of the training was about moving objects about. <laughs> and then suddenly, bingo, this is a, this is a nice city. And uh, <coughs> so we learned all these good traits and uh, this guy, he was a Swedish professor called Lindstrom. And what he's doing is called Lindstromers. And Lindstromers means that he was the one who said, the, the good quality housing area is an area which looks well from the freeway. That was his idea. And I, I rushed out of university to do all these fabulous things which will be much better for mankind. So. I was there, young, and going out, and was doing all these wonderful things. Then, then I married a psychologist. <laughs> I'm, I'm still married to her, sitting there. <laughs> and at once, we young architects, with all these fabulous futuristic ideas, we met a number of 
psychology students and sociology students and doctor students and students from other professions and nearly all of them were yelling, why are you architects not interested in people? Why don't they teach you anything about people in university for architecture schools? Have you ever considered why it is that your professors go out at four o'clock in the morning to take the architecture shots to be sure there are no people who could, who could uh, distract you in the, in the lectures when they show these pictures? Um, that was not an easy situation for any young architect, not, not me certainly. And uh, the outcome was that I had to go back to School of Architecture for another 40 years <laughs> to find out what they forgot to tell me. And then, of course, I realized that there wasn't much known about all this. So we had to start from square one and find out how people used architecture, how people used cities. And we had to start from square one. Very little was known as and Enrique Peñalosa was pointing out we knew much more and was much more interested in the mountain gorillas throughout. My own life is here in a short version that I, I, was, I have been 50 years in the area of academia and or doing research and writing a number of books. And then after a period, we started, I started to also to apply this knowledge to improve existing cities. I shall tell you about this later. I had, I've had this fantastic experience to see that my books are all over the place. And I'm especially proud that all my books have been translated into Chinese. And I knew, I know they are widely distributed because I've signed most of them. It was very hard work. <laughs> um, what, what really is a sorrow for me in my old days is that they never had time to read them over there. But maybe given time, they, they will have time to read them and things will change. Um, this next one is from Kazakhstan, from recently. And I, yesterday I was at the university here. We had funny hats, all of us. But I can assure you they are more funny, the hats they have in Kazakhstan. <laughs> and also you can see the faculty members of the School of Architecture. They're all sitting with my book in Kazakh, ready to go out to make a bigger, better Kazakh. And I'm, I'm quite proud about this sort of thing. At some point in this story, I started to be harassed by mayors from all kinds of places. They said, you can criticize, you're an academic, you're free to go around and write that we do crap built cities and that, that this city is bad and this city is bad, but my friend, couldn't you come and tell us please what to do? And um, that was the start of a little um, kitchen table operation with two, three, five of my students um, for some five, ten years, and then it was, the kitchen table was not big enough, and also my wife was a little bit tired, always having breakfast with all my former students. <laughs> um, so we formed a company, Gail Architects, with Helle Sohal, one of my former students, and uh, in these 15 years we've been out there. We have really ex experienced that there is a fantastic interest around the world for improving cities, for having livable cities. What we told in the firm, we said, if you want livable, sustainable and healthy cities, we can help you. And bang, the telephone started to ring. It's been ringing ever since. And now we have offices in San Francisco and New York and in Copenhagen. And we have done cities from Nuuk in Greenland to Christchurch after the earthquake, from Shanghai over here to Seattle and San Francisco over there um, in just 15 years. And that shows us this fantastic interest in, in how to make better cities for people and that so few knew something about it. So strangely enough, this little Danish group of people who studied this was called upon to come to all kinds of places. 
Now we are in 2016. And of course, having been for 50 years involved in this study of how, how built form influences the quality of life for people and the usability for people of the architecture and site plans and the cities, I would say that even if there have been not that many studying this, we, we know quite a few things now. And of course, you can make tables showing uh, Jane Jacobs up in front and some, and some of the more lowly stuff of mine down there and whatever. But there are a number of knowledge about that we know now that whenever we build anything, we manipulate ma ma massively with the conditions for people. And we can say, with, with, it's a quote from Churchill, which is very much bended, but first we shape the cities, but then, for God's sake, the cities shape us. We know now that there is, that what we build has a fantastic influence. We manipulate. The problem is we don't know enough about the result of all this manipulation. So we know quite a bit about good town planning, good site planning. But also in this process of studying, we've come to know quite a bit about the enormous importance of the details. Here you see the, one of the best public spaces in the world, the Campo uh, Piazza Il Campo in Siena in Italy. It's from the 14th century and has functioned ever since that time and is still one of the finest public spaces in the world. It's fantastic. If you think of Siena, everybody think about the Campo. And then you can wonder, is this a miracle or might it just be straightforward common sense? Over the years, we have made and, and identified a number of crucial issues for making good people landscape. And I will not go through it, but it's, we have these 12 uh, criteria and the first ones is to get rid of what, is, what we don't like at all, like traffic, like fear, uh, feeling of insecurity. And also we don't like, element, there are certain elements in our climate we don't like, we want to be protected against that. And when all the bad things are out, we can start to think about the comfort, how you could sit and stand and talk and play and see and hear all the basic things people would like to do in a pedestrian or people landscape. And then finally, there are the enjoyment that everything, it's so important that things are in human scale. It's so important that you can enjoy the positive parts of the climate and the positive parts of this climate here and the positive parts, parts of the climate back in Scandinavia, they are very much the same. And then finally, also it has to be made with great concern for, for the positive sense experiences. So views to water, uh, presence of greenery, and even good architecture, good design and good materials. But that is only one number 12 of 12 issues. For many years, architects have been thinking, if it looks good, it will work well. But I can assure you that that's not enough. Um, it has, all the practical, nitty-gritty things have to be organized. And furthermore, it has to be great architecture. If we go back to the campo, uh, to the campo in Siena and take this list along, we will find that for each of the items you can say, oh yeah, yes indeed, oh my dear, yes, yes, yes. And when we come down to the architecture, and design and materials, we can just say, wow, this is unique. That's why it's world famous and has been kept world famous and in all these years have worked well because it has all the things are right. So we know quite a few things which should be right for people to be comfortable. We also know a lot of other things like, we even know so much now that we can write books about how to study the life not the form, but the life. And that is very important because that's more complicated than studying the form. And we have to study both to make good places for people. In 
the world in in the work of mine um, in the last 15 years or 15 years ago there was a new Danish uh, foundation was popping up the foundation for the built environment and actually they were stinking rich and they were hardly established before they came down to university and say Jan we think that the kind of humanistic city planning research you are doing, that's very valuable for the built environment. Do you have enough money? And then, then uh, they started to say, would you like uh, PhD students and visiting professors and whatever. And suddenly we had enough money and we were able to establish a center for the study of public space, um, of public space research. And then we worked with that for a number of years in university. Then I had to resign because in Denmark when you were 70, at that point you had to go out of, of government employment. So in the meantime I started my own firm, Geel Architects. So I went over to Geel Architects and I have hardly arrived there before the people from this foundation approached me again and said, Jan, we would like you to sit down and write down everything you know <laughs> while you can still remember it. <laughs> and then they say, we know that you haven't got that much time, but isn't time a matter of how many assistants you will need? And then they, they did this, this little game again and say, would you need more? Yeah, maybe two more. <laughs> And then suddenly I had time and we did the book, <laughs> which was to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth of what we know about how built environment influences people today and why it is important that people should be taken care of in architecture and city planning. So we did this. And then again, much to my surprise, this rather humble book um, in just five years it, it is spread all over the world. I think it's out now by the end of the year in two, in 32 languages. And all the major languages are covered, as you can see. Um, yeah, the Russian is here. Romanian is here. We even have the Arab version now. And the French, they have it the first time in 40 years. There was a French translation of one of my books <laughs> in Paris. No, in Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was, of course, this phone call from the Greeks saying, Jan, we would like to publish your book. And I said to the Greeks, no, you should not. You have other things to use your money for. <laughs> no, 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 no way, no way. Just go ahead as best you can. But they say, no worry, no worry. The Danish embassy will cover the cost. <laughs> and then they said further, and the Danish embassy say that we need very quickly to start to think about walking more and bicycling more um, to better our economy. Um, so it came out in Greek also. Um, it's even out in English. <laughs> and by the way, I brought this copy along for the mayor of Halifax. Yeah. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now we are in the 21st century, and we've seen that in the 20th century we had two major planning paradigms who were running everything. The modernism, you can see it all over Halifax, and the motorism, you can see it all over Halifax. But it's very obvious now that we have a new planning paradigm by now. We have a distinct change in planning paradigm. The world is changing all the time. We have learned something, we have seen something. Um, and today, if you ask any mayor in the world, would you like a livable, sustainable and healthy city? He'll say, that's my program. That's exactly what we are after here in Halifax. And um, I'll not go into many details about this, but all this about livable, lively, that, of course, 
Meeting other people was always the greatest joy of man. We have a quote from one of the Icelandic sagas saying, man is man's greatest joy. And we have so many evidence from research that what is really interesting in cities are the people, are the other people. And you could spend hours looking at other people. And the most widespread social activity in, in throughout the life is just watching and learning from your fellow citizens. All this is very much uh, linked to the public spaces. And, and with a, a society where we have smaller and smaller households and more and more space for each individual, and we have ruined many of the spaces where we could meet. In the old cities, we always had spaces where we could meet. In the modern city, we never did spaces, we did leftover spaces. And it's very difficult to meet in a leftover space. So all this, whenever we do really good job in making good places for people. It's my experience to 30 years of working in real life, then people will come happily and take and, and, and do what they always did in cities. They will look at each other, they will meet, they will see times go by, they will have cultural agreements, whatever, whatever. And I should also say with the leisure time society, this has got more importance. One would say, some would say that with the iPhones and the tablets, we don't need public space no more. We have, we have, uh, we have cyberspace that will make public space redundant. There is not a single sign that this is happening. On the contrary, there's been a great upsurge in the catering for public space and the use of public space in just the 20 years where all this cyberspace has been developing. And I don't think any way that the direct contact between people can be superseded by some pictures or some Instagram or Facebook or whatever. That can inspire you to be even more eager to go and see with your own senses the real thing. So we've seen this upsurge of public space and the interest of lively cities. And we found there's a strong connection between lively cities and livable cities, quality of life. Another new driver in city planning is the demand that we should do much more to have sustainable city planning. And of course, the more we walk and bike, the better for the climate. But there is a very strong connection between public transportation and good public realm. Be to have alternatives to the motor car, you have to have other transportation. And of course, public transportation is in the process of being expanded and being improved in quality around the world. And then we have this public space, public realm um, liation. Uh, so we, we know that this issue of making sustainable cities is, is, has much more importance now. And that's some, something new, which is a strong driver. Another very strong driver is the sitting syndrome. The sitting syndrome comes, um, maybe I should start to say, we realized that for 50 years we made city planning which invited people to sit on their ass all day, all life. And then at some point we thought that maybe they will all go to the fitness center two times a week, lifelong. We know now that it's maximum 15% and only in a special age group who go to the fitness center or who really do a proper effort with their fitness. The rest of them, um, they, they, have the, they are in danger of having the sitting syndrome. Um, Inga and I, we have one of our daughters, she is a senior doctor now, and she has told me much about the sitting syndrome because they have gradually defined it more and more. And, and they say it doesn't matter if you are fat. But what really matters is if you are inactive. So you can be very slim and inactive and you have a problem. You can be very fat and active and you may not have a problem. But inactivity is the problem. And they also found that if you do a moderate exercise for one hour a day, maybe two times half an hour's walking, 
then you would have an average of seven extra years of life. Um, and furthermore, you will have a much better quality of life when you get old. And most importantly, you will be much more cheap for society uh, with the health costs. So there is very strong evidence that you should make people be moderately active. And then we realize that that is exactly the opposite we have invited for in the city planning. And then, of course, we have to invite for something else. We have from World Health Organization their global action plan, and one part of it is that please, cities, make sure that you make active and safe methods of traveling to and from school, such as walking and cycling. That is official United Nations policy. And if we go back to my very first slide, where I said that being sweet to the pedestrians and the bicycles is really something which will address these three issues. You will have more lively and livable cities, you will have more sustainable cities, and you will have more healthy cities. Then comes the question, what can we do by now? What we certainly have been good at is improving existing cities. And I will show you some examples. There are several cities, many cities now, who have really, as a guiding principle, in this city we'll do everything to invite people to walk and bicycle as much as possible in the course of the daily day doings. It's not about making parks for the Sunday thing, it's about the Monday. Um, one such city is my hometown of Copenhagen. And here we can study what happens if you invite pedestrians and public life for a sustain for a long period of time. Um, in Copenhagen, they've been at it for 53 years. 53 years ago, or 54 years ago, they closed the main street. <coughs> that was the same time as Jane Jacobs was sitting yelling in, in Greenwich Village and writing books. In Copenhagen, the politicians went out and closed streets. They never heard about Jane Jacobs, but they were worried that the businessmen could not sell enough because all the cars chased the people out of the city. So they closed the street, and everybody said that, <clears throat> oh, how silly it is, because we are Danes, we are not Italians, and it will never work in Denmark, and the climate is like in Dover, Scotia. It's not good, and people will never come out. And uh, then they closed it anyway, and next year we started to be Italians, and we've become more and more Italian ever since. <laughs> Just to show you what has happened in Copenhagen, they started very early on, and they have actually had a very active policy of every year doing some little things or doing some big things, but every year is a little bit better than yesterday, and yesteryear. This is how it started, and this is how the city center looks today. This is the interventions they have come up with in all these years. What was very different from in Copenhagen was that Copenhagen became the first city in the world where the life in the city was systematically studied and the results from these studies, which were done at the University and School of Architecture, they were systematically fed over to the, to the city, city hall and, and after a very short time, the city planners and the politicians got more or less desperate to have more knowledge about how the city was used and how the new streets and squares actually performed. And I had the great pleasure when I retired as a professor from the School of Architecture to get this nice letter from the mayor. Um, she said that if it hadn't been for you in the School of Architecture providing all these data about how the city worked, we politicians would never have dared to make Copenhagen the most livable city in the world. So she mentioned that they've been very dependent on having information of what they were doing and having arguments to the, to the shopkeepers and whatever about how they could make it better. Looking back at Copenhagen, we, we, we can see some interesting pattern which goes along with changes in society. We can see the first phase in this being good to people, that was being good to walking and promenading. That was being making pedestrian streets um, and promenades. 
And that was the first 20 years. Then we can see the next phase, the next 20 years, that was being good to staying and recreation. We now have the leisure time society and people have much more time. They have a bit more economy. They have quite a bit more economy. People have been traveled and seen nice places out in the world and they come back to Copenhagen and say, couldn't we have a place to have cappuccino here and all that stuff. So that was really, and that was also the time when tourism started, the traveling really started to grow. And then came this great urge to have places where you could not only walk in the city, but also stay and enjoy and, 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 and have recreation. There was this shift from um, towards the city being more and more recreational and being more and more working like a park. When we asked people 20, 30, 25 years, 30 years ago, why are you in town? They would say, I'm in town to shop. When we ask the same people today, the majority will say, that's a silly question. I'm in city because I want to go to the city. So the city has become a destination in its own right because um, that's the place where you can see what's going on in society. You can see what's in the shops. You, there are cultural events all the time. So if the city really works as a big, um, as a big recreation, as a big park, urban park, but also the, the shops are benefiting from this because the more people are in the city and the more they like to come there and the longer time they spend, the better for the businesses. We know that for absolute sure. Then we are into the third phase that is uh, more and more focused now on playing, sports, activities that you have to swim in the, in the harbor and you have all kinds of new squares and, and types of parks which are geared to in, invite you to do active things. The next phase, or where we are now, is that Copenhagen, in 2009, that's seven years ago, they made this strategy saying that we will make, that Copenhagen will be the best city in the world for people, and they have this very detailed strategy about why it should be, and one of the major issues of course, there's something about sustainability and health, but the major issue is about social inclusion, about what it's very good for democracy that the people meet regularly and feel part of the society, meet their, their fellow citizens face to face. And so they really have this, this uh, very social agenda, get out of your private homes and come and join all of us in the public spaces of good quality which we are providing and we would like more and more of you to do more and more things and we will provide the spaces. Um, so this policy has become very important in Copenhagen. I know that the city architect, when there is a big developer coming saying, I want to have this building permit for this big stuff, then she will say, say what have you done towards this goal? And how would you ensure that people spend more time in this area? And how will you ensure that they walk more in this area? And how will you ensure this and that? And if they can't say yes to all of it in a good way, she say, go home and take a closer look at the city strategy and come back with your project when you are ready. I have this for the mayor of Halifax. <laughs> In Copenhagen, they are now well into uh, uh, People's City 2.0. And one of the things they do, they go around and identify all the sunlit sidewalks so they can widen them and put good granite on them and so that people can enjoy the good weather when it's there. And also, they still are at it making more and more uh, nice places for people. This is one a brand new square. This is how it looked some years ago. And this is how it looks now. But one of the things I think is most interesting in Copenhagen and which could really be inspirational for Halifax is the way all our streets are, have been treated. All our streets used to be four or five asphalt lane, street asphalt from wall to wall. And now they are all of them 
all the major streets, there are two lanes, one in each direction. We never use one-way streets. That's something traffic engineers love, but people doesn't love them. Um, <laughs> and the ordinary streets now would be two lanes, a good median so that people can rest there and get across safe. We know that people cross anywhere, so we can as well make it safe. <laughs> then, then by taking space from the cars, we can have street trees, we can have bicycle lanes, and this lower street is much more beautiful, it's much more safe than the upper street, and miracle, 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 the modern traffic engineers can have the same number of cars go through the lower street as they could in the 680s in the upper street. So car traffic engineers have become much more clever if they are prodded to do it. Um, there's another little detail I would like to point to. That is, uh, also I call this phase four, that is now it's not only the city center, but it's the whole city which shall be good for people. And one of the things which are done throughout the city and many Danish cities is that whenever you have a small street coming out to a big street, you take the sidewalk and the bicycle lane from the big street just across the small street, you narrow the small street, you have room for a, for a bench and a tree, whatever, and that's fine, that's great. That's, you prioritize uh, any guy walking or bicycling is just as good as a guy in a Mercedes Benz. But then I talked to our daughter, another daughter by the way, and she said, oh, Papa, it's so wonderful what they made in our area now with these sidewalks across the streets. But now little Laura, who is seven years, she can walk on the sidewalk all the way from our door to the school. So she doesn't have to cross any streets anymore. And that is a very important thing when you're seven, that, you, that it's the cars who have to cross sidewalks instead of little girls have to cross. Uh, <laughs> This was one of the things I went around today and we said, here we could do this, here we can do this. Actually, it's never, I think that it's not written in the human rights rules by the United Nations that whenever a car comes to a crossing, it should be allowed to go full speed in all four directions. <laughs> That's something the traffic engineers have told us for 50 years, but we could change that rule and say that Laura has the priority and the cars have to slow down a bit, whatever. Um, <laughs> I have realized that I have to speed up. And I always say that sort of in the middle of things. <laughs> and I hope so, so much that it will happen, but we'll see. <laughs> Copenhagen very early on made a commitment to invite bicycling and to be sweet to bicycle. And they realized that if people were bicycling, they could use, they could need much less asphalt for the cars and the traffic. By now we have in Copenhagen a complete good bicycle lane system covering every major street in the city. And it's good wide bike lanes with a curb to the sidewalk and a curb to the traffic. And over the years, it's developed into a complete transport system. That means that every third family with children in Copenhagen, they have a cargo bike so they can bring their children um, to school and, and activities. The, the lower ones are, are some of ours and they can tell, tell us that it's much more fun to sit in front in a cargo bike than to sit strapped up in the rear of a car. That's fun. The great problem in bicycle system are always the crossings. And so you can never have a safe bicycle system unless you address the crossings. Here is a typical well-organized crossing in Copenhagen. There are medians for the pedestrians to wait on and there are bicycle lanes. And the ones which are most dangerous, that means where they've had accidents, they paint them blue to show that this is where you shall have extra um, Co uh, concentration. But this is how a nice city crossing should 
look like. Also, to make a good bicycle system, you meet, need to link it with the other modes of transportation. All taxis in Copenhagen are forced to take two bicycles, a male and a female bicycle, if it has to be quick. Um, and all the trains are organized in such a way that you can take your bike for free, and that's very popular. Um, that means that suddenly you can go over a big distance. You have a system now. My wife and I, we can do two kilometers to the station, 20 kilometers in the train, and two kilometers, and then we are in the son's house. Over the years, this has developed into a bicycle culture. And that will be that, it, that it's into bike. Businessmen do it, pregnant mothers, children, everything. And the Crown Prince does it occasionally. The Crown Princess does it more frequently. But they do but all, all of them bike. Then, of course, everything is happy and no problem with Copenhagen. No, because now we have serious problem with congestion <laughs> on the bicycle lanes. And this little paper cutting is for 2002. So we have that problem now for 15, 16 years. And what do you do with this problem? Do you do like this silly project by Norman Foster in London? <laughs> where you take the bicycles up in 30 meters height in the strong wind and make them struggle up and down the ramps and then you bike endlessly without any sidewalks with beautiful girls to look at, without <laughs> any shops to look at, without any attractions at all except the strong western wind you have to overcome. This is absolutely what not to be done. What you do, and what we do in Copenhagen, we just widen the sidewalks. We double the size of all the critical sidewalks, and that's good economy because the sidewalk, a bicycle lane can take, uh, can take uh, five times more people than can a car lane. So if you have enough side bicycles, it's good economy to give them the more space. Where do they get space from? They take it from the cars. And, um, that is still good economy. In some of the major streets in Copenhagen now we have 40,000 bicycles a day. Um, and they've been forced to double the capacity in the trains because that became more and more popular. And also now they are full speed into a, pro pro a process of making all kinds of shortcuts and bicycle bridges over the harbor, bicycle bridges over major roads so that always it's shorter and quicker to take the bicycle than to take the car. Over the years we've seen all this, all this compassion for the bicyclists have resulted in more and more people feeling the invitation and the inclination to go biking instead of going by public transportation or by, by car. And now we are up to 37% of everybody going to work in Copenhagen arriving on a bicycle. No, this is an old figure, because the latest figure from last year was that 45% of the people in Copenhagen, they go to a bike to work. I have the plan here, we will be the best city in the world for bicycling, that's for the mayor of Halifax. <laughs> Being an old guy like I am, I've had the great pleasure to see the kind of humanistic ideas in city planning which we started at the university really to pursue 50 years ago, that they are now spread more and more out in society. And you can look at this one, it's not my grandmother, this is the Danish Minister of Culture and she came to me and said, have you seen my homepage, Jan? Because I was asked to do a, a, a picture for an enquete of, of European cultural ministers sitting in their favorite sofa reading their favorite book. And I took your book, I took the English version so that people could see what I'm really interested in. And also now they have changed the Danish architectural policy and say now the purpose of architecture is, is to put people first. And this is a little picture of the Danish government the new Danish government arriving 
on the, to the royal castle to get their commissions as ministers. They used the bicycles that day. They just told the guards, would you look after our bikes? We have some business with the queen. And <laughs> that was a day when, when no bicycles were stolen. Um, <laughs> there were no bicycle, limousines no more until next day, of course. But there were electrical limousines, so that's my story. Are there other cities in the world who have similar stories? Yes, indeed, there are more and more, and we have not too much time. Melbourne in Australia has a fantastic story. It was really a, a, a place, no good place. The city centre was, was hated and it was absolutely devoid, devoid of people. Um, and in 85, 1985, they decided to invigorate the city. They've done everything in the book you can do to make a lively, wonderful city. One of the things they have done is that they decided that in this city we walk. They widened all the sidewalks to eight meters. They put granite on them. They put street trees so you can have shade. Uh, they have the most beautiful street furniture in the world. They have rules that you are not allowed to make blank walls or uninteresting facades. And, and they, they have been running this for now uh, 20, uh, 25 years, um, 30 years maybe. Um, Melbourne now has, is by far the best city in the Southern Hemisphere. And it's the best city, of course, in Australia. People go straight past Sydney to come down to Melbourne, where it's really yeah, it's a nice. Melbourne is very much as good as Paris, but the weather is quite a bit better. So <laughs> Melbourne is really a miracle of city planning. Go there. Melbourne also is full speed doing what they call Copenhagen-style bicycle lanes. That means that the park cars protect the bicycles instead of the Bicycle protect the car cars. I don't know if you know that system, but that's very widespread in North America. Um, but here are some examples of Melbourne bikes where they always put them next to the sidewalk and with a little buffer zone out to the cars, as it should be. And they do this all over the city except where the archbishop's car uh, it will be found. Then they can take a little detour there. So my wife's advice to you is, if you don't know what to do, move to Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit north of Melbourne is another city. And they were increasingly envious of Melbourne. And after some years, they came creeping and say, could you come and Melbourneize Sydney? And then we moved into Sydney, and Sydney, uh, we're not time really, but Sydney, it has a wonderful waterfront, and it's good for a number of things, but it certainly has a very lousy uh, downtown. Um, but they have a very, very, um, very good mayor who, has, who is able to formulate goals for the city, and so she has this strong urge to make uh, much better quality, much better sustainability, and much better health in Sydney. And Sydney is going green. And they have been, what some of the things I've noticed in Sydney is they're very slow in getting things done. But they're very good in making posters about what they would <laughs> like to do. And the city is full of posters that now we shall walk and bicycle and we are going to do it for the climate. And you voted yourself for this policy and here it comes and it costs you two, two parking spaces, but it's for the betterment of man and climate. They are very careful in telling and that's a very, very good idea to tell the people what we are after. They have in, <coughs> they have in Sydney what I also will advise very much in Halifax, they have a strong vision of where they want to be 15 years from now. The main street was full of cars, now it's, it's been closed and they are in full speed putting in light rail, bicycles and pedestrians in the main street. It was high time, it was an awful place. They are full speed making bicycle lanes in Sydney. And if we look at the table of livable cities in the world, you can see some funny things here that Copenhagen and Melbourne will invariably be competing.
thinking about being on top of the list, um, depending on what kind of criteria they have. But also you can see the Sydney is here, Oakland is here, Stockholm, Zurich, uh, Helsinki, uh, Munich, and Vienna, <coughs> and, and, and to my surprise, so Tokyo. But uh, all these cities have got quite a bit for people in the city, and that makes them, in my point of view, candidates to be among the most livable cities in the world. Um, the story of New York, we haven't got time for that, but the mayor was called Michael Bloomberg and he made this fantastic plan saying <coughs> New York would be the most sustainable metropole in the world in no time to speak of. That means while I'm still mayor. <laughs> <laughs> then he selected Jeanette Sadikhan as a transport commissioner and Hardly had she been selected where before she popped up in Copenhagen with the planning commissioner and they went all over the city and I have no time to give you details but she studied it and in the end she and the other commissioner said we want a city like this one, when can we start? <laughs> and I said Monday. <laughs> <laughs> then we got commissioned and we started working in right away in, in New York, and they being Americans, they are very, very fast, so <coughs> after a few little days, they started to throw in Copenhagen-style bicycle lanes protected by park cars, and it's not only in, in Manhattan, in all the avenues, it's also in all the boroughs, and then after a while, <coughs> we started to talk about why are there no benches in New York? Why are there no sidewalk cafes? Why can people not enjoy New York? Why would they have to rush from A to B, from the suburb to the from this uh, from the subway to the office all the time? And then they started to talk about maybe they should have a Champs Elysees or something, or maybe some squares like in Europe. And then our eyes fell on Broadway. Was that really necessary? And after a year, it was figured out that they could do without Broadway. This is Times Square Broadway. And in 2009, um, we were, I would not say we, but we advised them, and, and they simply closed Broadway uh, in all the important crossings, um, primarily, of course, Times Square. So this is Times Square in the morning of 2009, and this is Times Square in the evening of 2009. And the moment it was closed, all these people come in there. And now there are between 300 and 500,000 people visiting Broadway and visiting Times Square every day. In the meantime, since 2009, they made 50 other squares like this one all over New York, all of them by taking asphalt from the cars, giving the space to the people and they become almost crazy in making New York a much nicer place. And this scene of recreation is reappearing in this <laughs> front cover of New Yorker that they could even bring the prairie into Times Square, and that would be better. And uh, of course we can start to sing with Frank Sinatra about Broadway. When you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> they heard it in they heard this song in Moscow. And at a at a conference in, in Montreal this little man came came galloping up to me and said, I'm the deputy mayor from Moscow. Can you come and do a New York for us? <laughs> can you humanize Moscow in 12 months? <laughs> when can you come? Monday. <laughs> and then we went to Moscow and I've never seen anything so depressing. <laughs> the whole city was completely inundated by cars. They, it appeared that there were no parking rules. And it was a belief that the freedom from communism was the right to park wherever you saw it. <laughs> so there was enormous amount of traffic in the streets and nice little side streets would look like this one. And we took a little look at the main street, Moscow, because of 
that the white sidewalks, they decided that of course they could park on the sidewalk also. So all the way down there, there was parking and there was one meter lift for pedestrians. There were hardly any pedestrians. And there were, the sky was full of advertisement and the buildings were full of icicles, so the pedestrians didn't have a good time. <laughs> the first thing they did in Moscow was, they said, how many books have you written here? We'll publish them all in Russia. So they published them all. <laughs> and they are published by the city of Moscow. And uh, the, the word guy is a Danish ambassador, by the way. <laughs> uh, then we were commissioned to do a study of how Moscow was used by people that was a very easy study because there were no people left. <laughs> um, and that, of course, is a very strong finding in a major city in the world that only around the metro stations were there people. But they couldn't walk from there to there to there because all the roads were blocked by parking and whatever. Then I was called up to the mayor and had dinner with him. And he said, what would be in your report? I said, Maybe the idea of parking on Main Street, sidewalks on Main Street, Moscow is not the best idea I ever saw. And I would mention it gently in my report. Two months later, I was back. Whoops, no cars on the sidewalk on Main Street, Moscow. And then if you thought, yeah, they have very efficient democracy over there. <laughs> Then if you, if you forgot about it, the mayor had this little car which, which lifted your car uh, up there and, and, and went to somewhere. May, rumors have it it was Siberia, but, but no. <laughs> but anyway, they, um, it was very efficient, very, very efficient. And then one and a half year later, I'll show you this. I call it the miracle of Moscow because instead of cars, parking on the sidewalk. Now they have, for the full length, they have benches, they have planters. Instead of a green, gray, street, gray street, they have a green street. And also all the advertisement in the air have come down so you can see Kremlin in the distance. In one and a half year, or furthermore, they had not, they were not, uh, co uh, coats were not needed anymore. So good as a <laughs> But my point is, my point is that they have, my point is that, that they have got very, very fast through, through a number of improvements. And that is very typical of cities all over the world by now. That I said there are new paradigms of city planning. It's not about motorism and, and modernism no more. It's about livability, sustainability and health. Walk and bike, my friends. In Lisboa, in Portugal, here we are, you can see that the major square by the river, by the water, is now clear. In Buenos Aires, in Argentina, you can see this rapid bus system down in the middle. In Romania, you can't see much, but because my book is out there now, they will sort it out very quickly. <laughs> One of the miracles of the world is Perth in West Australia. I started working there in 93, and we took this picture of the pedestrian street at 7 o'clock on a Tuesday. And now, uh, 23 years later, or whatever, we took on the same Tuesday at 7 o'clock at the same place the picture at the right. The city has come miraculously to life there are many more city people living there, and it's a, become a really wonderful city. It was a bloody modernist city where you buy here, you work here, you live here, you go to hospital here, and, and whatever you do here. Uh, now they mixed it, and it's fantastic success. And you think that the mayor in Moscow was rather rude with his crane to take the cars out? But think about this mayor from Lithuania, <laughs> from, from Vilnius. He doesn't like people to park in his bike lanes. I think you should try to think about that here. <laughs> when you see some people deliveries in the bike lanes, maybe your mayor can rent a car like this and do a little tour. Um, 
it's, you only do it once. <laughs> and, but that's a sign that all over the world we see this urge to be more people friendly and to have a more livable situation. I'm even, if I can whisper to you, that we are doing a bicycle plan for Singapore, where they have 35 degrees every day and it's very humid. Still they want to bicycle because they realize that the days of the automobiles are over. Actually they are. Automobile driving in the world topped in 2009 and it has been going down ever since. And I think that automobile is a very, very mediocre mode, mode of mobility in the big cities we have in the 21st century. It was good in the Wild West in Detroit way back in 1905, but taking, giving, believing in mobility with a rubber wheel in each corner of each person in the enormous cities of Mexico City, of Sao Paulo, of Lagos, of Ho Chi Minh City, of Jakarta, of Shanghai and the big cities in China. Automobile is simply not a smart mode of transportation and it is on its way out. Interesting. How far are you in that process? Anyway, I'll, I'm just about to finish. I have a little extra story. Because I showed you the miracle of Moscow and we were very fired up and they were very eager and we had all kinds of plans to continue and then this chap Putin couldn't keep his fingers of crime, Crimea and then the Ukrainian thing popped up and then European Union put a froze on relations to Russia who put a froze on relations to European Union. So we wrote them many times say when are we to go to do phase two and there was no phase two. And so there were two and a half years with no contact. But then this spring, I got this message from my good friend, the, the deputy mayor from Montreal. He invited me to come over and do a speech in, in one of his conferences. It was on endangered species in natural reserves. And I was to speak for five minutes. And then I realized I was so just giving this as an invitation, he needed a pretext to get me over. Um, so I gave a, a, a really nice speech about endangered species, and, um, <laughs> but luckily only for five minutes. And then they took me all over the city and said, we wanted you to come here to see what we've done while you have not been here, but following your instructions to the letter. And then they took me around and it was a, full, a, a miracle. New York was fantastic and they did it in seven years. But by golly, Moscow has done all this in three years. This is how it looked like and how it looks today. This is a pedestrian crossing I took an interest in now. It's looking like this. And they, they have now introduced bicycle lanes all over. They've organized the parking which I said, you must organize the parking, you can never be better. They have reduced the parking very much. People didn't like it, but it had to be done to make a proper city. And this car over there is a mayor's car and they lift the hood when they stop now because then the parking police, which is now very active, cannot see that it's mayor's car in a, in a pedestrian crossing. It is a complete it, it, it is a complete miracle that, that um, they have bicycle li lights and they still have the cars going around. They are green to take the cars to Siberia. And they have this bicycle system and they have the odd delivery in the bike lane, but that's the exception from the rule. On this recent visit in Moscow, I saw suddenly a, a monument, a, sta a monument for Corbusier, because he was a stout communist. He built, he built several buildings for Stalin, so they made a monument. And I had the chance to go over to Corbusier and tell him gently where he was wrong. <laughs> Welcome to the 21st century.
he took the floor and kept it. <laughs> um, I realized we are running out of oxygen <laughs> any moment. But, but uh, Eric, um, would, would there be time for a few questions? Yes. It should not be many, because then we see all these people yep. fall over, of suffocating. Okay. We'll start Christian, and then we'll move forward. Uh, thank you for the great talk, and uh, thank you for giving our mayor so many so good ideas. Um, OK. I've been asked to stand up so you can all hear. Um, so unfortunately, while hearing about all these great ideas, um, 17 houses in the core of our city are being demolished as we speak to replace them with the car dealership. And obviously you don't know the details of that issue, so you can't speak to that issue. Uh, but some of the residents from that area are actually here uh, today. And so if you could say a few words about the impact of uh, large parking lots in the core of a city and whether um, having a large dealership in the center of a city is, is good corporate citizenship and whether it's good economic planning, that some of those words might mean a lot to people who are here. Yeah, generally, I'm not a strong believer of being for 48 hours in a city and then have, have detailed opinions about this city. But I do have this, I do have this, um, I, cannot at, uh, I cannot address this particular issue. But I really think that this city should be very, very careful with retaining the small people scale in the city. Because what I see is that whenever there is a chance, the small scale goes and some elephants move in, and then the charm is gone and the character of Halifax is gone. And I even think that all the architects here should have a special training in handling small scale so that whenever they make buildings, they land nicely, whatever, and maybe uh, they, it could be, there could be a plan to be much more careful with what is left of the heritage. Um, I, I, I do, yeah, and, and I took this along because I, I meant it to end a little bit about it. I had this feeling of déjà vu. I lived in Toronto in the 70s, and coming here, I had the feeling that, oh, nothing much has changed. Um, that still motorists and modernists were at large and that this new wave of city planning which are people oriented had not really hit Halifax yet. And I thought about the 40,000 students who are here who would be an excellent base for making a, a bicycle city but you have to be consistent and it has to be all over so you can bicycle safely and the cars will know that there are bicycles in this city. So my feeling was that there is needed a strategy. Where will this city like to be in 2030 or 35? And how can we get there? How can we make some strategy documents who can like lead us? And I think that a plan for the people and a plan for the bicycles would be very, very useful and with some goals and where we would like to reach what level. Also, we talked at the river, riverfront today or the waterfront today that increasingly there are tourists coming here and the special quality and special character of Halifax is a major um, destination argument and you have to preserve that. You have to make it really a nice place to visit and I see that the waterfront has many nice places. And then well, how you come from the waterfront into the city, that is apparently not addressed. And so I think that should be addressed. And that the city should be better and linked better with the waterfront. And the waterfront is already on its way. Um, I think that the small scale should be, should be, there should be a small scale task force who would go and kick everybody in the bots, if they don't attend to the small scale where people are, but sort of land these big elephants in, in the city. Um, and also, I, I think that we should find some chemical which can reduce the length of buses. Um, yes. That would be a very smart thing to do. And also maybe look after the public transportation to check that there are no 
Not too many buses in any street, more than is needed. It appears that there's a lot of strategies which could be followed, but the major one would be something about uh, having strategies of where you would like the city to be uh, it's at some point for, and which major things you would like to address. And should I say something, that should be livability, sustainability and health. And that will automatically give you a much more people-friendly city and a better city for the citizens and a better city for the visitors and a city which will be remarkable in the whole map of North America because you have so much, uh, so protect what you have and, 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 and look after the first things. And I, I saw many of these projects which some of them were good, but most of them I was horrified to hear that is they, they are going to go and they are going to go and whatever. So also I think there should be a climate plan. That means that you should realize that in this part of the world, sunshine is very, very important. And also what we hate very much is shade and wind. And so that it, there should be a plan saying in this part of the city, we will not accept any less sunshine than now. And in this part of the city, we will not accept any more wind than now. So that we can protect some of the good places climate-wise we have today and it's not all will be overpowered by towers who are shading here and there and there and creating turbulent winds so you can't stay in your own city. So make a climate plan. Uh, there are examples of this. I mentioned San Francisco as one who has done such a plan. Melbourne has also done such a plan. Sydney has not, and there's not a, a ray of sunshine in Sydney. Sunny Sydney, completely dark because of high rise. Nobody thought about it that sunny Sydney should preserve the sun. Um, but you have to do it because you're much more to the north and you have low sun angles and you're so dependent on a nice climate on the good days that it, you cannot afford to make everybody put up high buildings wherever they like. So there's something to be done here. Yeah. Sorry for this rather longish, longish answer. <laughs> I loved your comment about the need for a pedestrian department, and I just wonder, I think everyone in this room is probably uh, singing from the same song sheet, the, the challenge becomes the conflict with the engineers and the traffic engineers, and we have a history of having traffic engineers uh, from Western Canada come here, and they want all these new standards with wide roads. Uh, they set standards based on the suburbs, and they try and introduce them downtown. How do you... Any ideas or strategies we can get around that? I've always wondered, maybe we should partner with uh, small cities in Europe and bring their in traffic engineers over to educate us on that. Do you have other ideas? Get them to do it. <laughs> oh, I can offer you the traffic engineer from Copenhagen. He um, retired a little while ago, and now we have him on our staff. He was very instrumental in helping New York to put in their bicycle lanes. And uh, he is a rather extraordinary traffic engineer because he believes in the purpose of traffic engineering is to keep traffic out or keep, <laughs> keep it down. <laughs> and, and he also had, uh, so he had a number of wise things which he did. Uh, whenever there was congestion, he said, I can go there and add another lane, there are no congestion for three months. Then there's a new congestion and we have a wide street. So when he saw congestion, he went out there right away and took away a lane. Then it was really, really bad. And then three months later, there were no problem because everybody had realized they, that was not smart to go there. Um, <laughs> he also had this other idea that if you can't park, you won't drive, which is very smart. Um, so he removed 2% of the parking every year. And he kept saying, if you do it slowly, and don't talk about it. Nobody will notice. <laughs> so in his time, the parking in Copenhagen was reduced by 30%. At the same time, the quality of, city, of the city was raised by several hundred percent. 
and more and more people flocked to the city. It, you could not really go there smartly with the car, but you could go there many other ways and there were much more to come for because the moment you had the, reduced the traffic and reduced uh, the, the parking, there was much more opportunity to have a wonderful city. And he was also the one who said that how many cars can have a good time in my city? Um, let's say it was uh, 100,000 cars or 50,000 cars. Then he had counters in all the streets here, out to the suburbs, and when they 50,000 had gone in, they went on red all the way. He called it the, the discotheque doorman method. That when you have a discotheque, you have a big doorman, and you know that 200 people can dance and be merry, but 300 people would get in, in, in fights. So he made sure that no more than 200 people, 200,000 cars or whatever, could enter the city. And then they went, then he said they can stop out there in the suburbs and pollute where they come from until we have time to accommodate him in our city. That guy, he, he's a quite a good guy. Would you like to know, lend him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the major point is not about this guy, but the major point is maybe that in our culture, we have really massaged the traffic planners, so they are now thinking completely different than what they did early on. And, and they, they have been brought up with all this knowledge about people and uh, whatever, and livability, and we have wonderful cooperation with the, with the traffic people. Um, so it's a matter of education and massage. And, and I have met that guy from the Western Australia, from West Canada. I met him several times. <laughs> I think he is like the ones from the Technical University in Minsk in, in uh, Belarus. The, the, we need more lanes. The traffic will grow. We will have 11 lanes so we are prepared for the future. <laughs> and that won't work. <laughs> Okay. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you have any examples of cities and strategies that have um, incorporated the uh, preparing for an aging demographic into the livable cities um, strategies. Because the you know, aging demographic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, we, we could go more into detail and I know that in New York they have special task forces who go out to the areas in the city where there are the greatest number of, of elderly people to see what can be done. But my major answer to this is that if we make a city good for people, it will also be much better for the elderly people. There is here in Canada some organization called 880 saying that if you are sweet to the people at 8 and at 80 in your city planning, the rest will have a good time. And, and, and to me, it's generally the same things which all of us are, are looking for. And being good to people generally will also be good for elderly people. And we know this is a fantastic new challenge that we know we have to make the cities so that these, all these people who get older, they move on the streets every day and keep part of society and the doctor will tell them to go 10,000 steps a day, I know. Um, so um, we, we have to make better cities for people also to accommodate that problem or that, that, that uh, scenario. Yeah, now we will do maybe three questions and uh, <laughs> The furthest away. That's you. No, that's not you. That's behind you. But you're next. Nothing talks like money. I mean, everyone is obsessed with, politicians are obsessed with balancing the books. Our shop owners are worried about making sure the business is viable. But we don't have the data that you provided to the city of Copenhagen. Would you say it's the responsibility of the city to commission studies to, to get the numbers, get the data so we can convince the people, or is it the university, or is it a combination of both? What's the strategy that you think we should be using for that? Good question. 
because I really think that a city like this one should get uh, start right away to find out how the city is working today from a people point of view. And that can be done actually quite simple. And there's a number of things uh, one could do. Um, in many cases, in some cases, my and my teams, they, they come over and, and, and teach people to fish. That means make a master class and then the university and the city planners do what they have to do. And or that maybe uh, our people do some of it and the people in the university, they ship in with the field studies and it's sort of done in cooperation. And so there's a number of ways, but I really think that if you have to repair an old house, the first thing you do is you investigate the old house before you make a plan for the repairs. And the same thing with the city. You have to investigate the city, find out how it works now, and then it comes out very clearly where it could be improved. Uh, so I really think that that is what you, and I also mentioned, maybe I didn't mention it, but I think that every city should have a department for looking after the quality of the city from the point of the people. Um, and many cities do have now. And then it was you. I think the short answer is, I don't know a thing about it. <laughs> uh, that, that my team doesn't work with, we have enough problems actually <laughs> to, to look after. But uh, again, you bring up any important issues. There are several, impo many important issues, uh, air quality, whatever, whatever. Um, but, but we are mostly concerned with the people and the public life and the activities in cities in the leisure time society where we get older and have lots of leisure time and we are more and more lonely and isolated and in that is where we see the good public spaces, the parks, the squares, the waterfronts come in as places where you can go and have some recreation and get some exercise and whatever or go that way to your work or bicycle that way. I can see in in Halifax here, that 10 years from now you will have a roaring bicycle system because all over the world you can see the bicycling is on the steep improvement, uh, incline, um, I think it's called. And uh, with 40,000 students, it's an obvious city to, to do something with the bicycling. And that's a very good way of get your exercise every day. Yeah. Yeah, coming from Scandinavia, having worked in Finland, Sweden and Norway also, the, I, I guess that we very soon will find that there are many similarities in, in the climate challenge. The, um, the topography question, um, I've not studied that carefully here, but I know that um, um, in many places they have they, they make good use of electrical bicycles to help them up, down, no problem. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so, um, and, and in, in, in Trondheim, Norway, they have escalators for bicycles, but maybe we don't need it here. But uh, I really can see that there's a lot of bicycling which could be done here if you had a proper system and not just some fragments which are laughable actually. There's one more question, and that would be there. I'd love to hear you uh, just speak a little bit about tall buildings and what you find is tall. And is, there, is it possible to have a good tall building? Tall buildings are always very controversial. And, and we have 
um, this being the truth, the full truth, um, I deal quite a bit with tall buildings here. And there are many aspects. One, and, and generally, it's, it's well known that I don't like tall buildings. Uh, and especially, I think that tall buildings are very silly to put up in climates where you have much wind and low sun angles. I think that's, that always causes a deterioration of the climate in quite a circle around the, the tall buildings. So, but, but again, it could be done more smart. Uh, and I like the Vancouver model where they have, they have the street system and then they say that you can build a slender tower in the middle of a block but keep the street at four, four story high. In Vancouver they don't this too much so there are too many of these so uh, but the idea is basically good. We also have in this book a number of studies where we go up in high rise to see what happens and we realize that you, as long as you are up to five stories or six stories you can still follow what's going on in the streets and the street can see that there are lights in the window and you're part of the city. Beyond six story you're part of the airline system <laughs> and uh, you're not part of the city and the only people who really benefit from these top story are the developers and also it may look very smart five kilometers away but who, who will have the energy to go five kilometers away to enjoy. Uh, so I'm basically rather critical about high-rise buildings in windy, low sun angle climates. I, I think that Paris is not so bad, it's seven stories. Ba ba Barcelona is not so bad, it's seven stories. Um, the Venice is not so bad, it's four, six stories. Um, and they have wonderful public spaces and they are very dense so, but and sometimes I say that the lazy architect's answer to density is a tower. The same density could be achieved many times with lower buildings, but that's much harder work. But it has to be done. That was my last word for today. <laughs>